Hey there, and welcome to the first episode of Fantastic Biology. Today's topic, is there a limit to a dragon's size? Well, of course there is no limit, it's magic. There is nothing wrong with seeing it that way, and simply enjoying huge fire-breathing lizards for the fun of it. But just for the sake of this thought experiment, let's imagine dragons were real animals bound by the laws of physics. How big would be too big? Where is the limit? And why? Well, basically dragons are just huge terrifying lizards. So you might have guessed it already, we're gonna do some bad science with what the internet taught me about dinosaurs. Because of their looks, dinosaurs are the obvious choice for comparison here. So how big was the largest dinosaur? If we go by mass, the heaviest dinosaur to roam the earth was Argentinosaurus. Its weight was around 50 to 100 tons and it could get as long as almost 40 meters from head to tail. But a long-necked giant like Argentinosaurus would probably not be the first thing that comes to mind if you compare dragons to dinosaurs. Dragons are usually portrayed as predators with long sharp teeth, so we'd picture them more like a T-Rex. But mind you, T-Rex was not the biggest of the carnivorous dinosaurs. That rank goes to Spinosaurus, at least for now. It could grow up to 15 meters long with a weight around 8 tons. This seems like a dwarf compared to the huge Argentinosaurus with at least 4 times its weight and more than double its length. But why is there such a huge gap? Well, I hate to break it to you, but if you want to grow big and strong, go veggie. I know what I'm about to tell you is hard to imagine in a time where hunting is synonymous with the epic journey to the supermarket, but back in prehistoric times, hunting required serious amounts of energy. The reward may be high once you take down your prey, but not every chase ends up being a success. So at times, a predator might lose more energy than it gets. To support a giant body, you need a lot of energy though. Running around when hunting prey can be especially costly. Since leaves don't tend to run away, Argentinosaurus didn't need to do a lot of sprints between trees while eating. Predators, on the other hand, had to strike a delicate balance between being big and terrifying without losing the ability to give chase and sustain their bodies though. This is also where we say goodbye to cunning dragons such as Smog from Tolkien's The Hobbit. Most of our energy is used up by our brains. Even though titanosaurs were huge, their brains were, well, tiny. 15 meter long ampelosaurus brain was the size of a tennis ball. Being huge, you normally don't move fast. So you don't need excellent eyesight and an apparatus to process all that information. Well, let's say it that way, if you were a titanosaur, your brain would not be capable of much more than, oh. Uh, Food. Or, yeah, let's reproduce. <clears throat> well, let's just say Bilbo's job would have been much easier than Tolkien made it seem. Over the years, we've learned a lot from dinosaur remains. But bones can only tell us so much. It's still not entirely certain whether dinosaurs were cold or warm-blooded. Actually, it is most likely for them to have been an intermediate form. Okay, but why is that important when we talk about a dragon's size? Because metabolism has a huge impact on size. If a dragon is warm-blooded, which means it can regulate its body temperature, that feature comes with a price. The biggest mammal to ever roam the earth was Indricotherium transuralisum, or at least that's how I think it's pronounced. Anyway, this cute little critter had a size of 5.5 meters at shoulder level. Let's reference this to some mammals alive today. The biggest known elephant was 4 meters at shoulder level, and the biggest giraffe around 3.5 meters. Compared to those two, Indricotherium still seems huge, but compared to Argentinosaurus, not that impressive. And both were vegetarians. So why was Indricotherium that much smaller? For warm-blooded animals, body temperature becomes a problem at some point, because they start to accumulate heat due to the volume surface area ratio. What this boils down to is that if you have a large body, you produce a lot of heat. At some point, heat starts to break down the proteins in your body. This is why a fever is helpful at first to help your body get over an infection, but once the fever gets too high, your body is in danger of overheating and breaking those proteins your existence depends on. And the bigger an animal gets, the more mass they have, but the surface won't grow proportional to its mass. Therefore, heat loss over the surface can keep up with the heat being generated by the animal's mass. Cold-blooded dragons, on the other hand, would be dependent on the surrounding temperature for their body temperature. Like modern-day lizards, they need to sunbathe to warm up or to get into shade to cool down. In this case, the environment would have a huge impact on the dragon's size, because if it was too cold, they won't be able to get their bodies to a comfortable temperature. 
Hence, cold-blooded dragons living in a cold climate would probably be smaller than those living in a hot or moderate climate. But when it's hot, the problem with overheating still remains. They might circumvent this issue by cooling off in the shade or in pools of water. But if neither was around, there is another viable strategy. To feature large bodily appendages. Like, yeah, you guessed it, wings. Wings would increase the surface ratio by a lot and could circumvent this problem. And anyway, what would a western dragon be without its wings? So what we should really compare the dragons to are the pterosaurs. The name pterosaur is a combination from the Greek Pteron and Sauros, which means wing lizard. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs though, they are their own biological order. So let's leave the dinosaurs behind and look at these flying reptiles that used to reign over the skies and are the closest thing to a dragon that ever existed. One of the biggest pterosaurs found up until now was named after the Aztec serpent god Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatlus nothropi has a wingspan of up to 12 meters and was roughly the size of a modern day giraffe. Adding muscles and everything to its bones, we don't know exactly what Quetzalcoatlus would have weighed. And scientists came to very different conclusions depending on the model that was used to calculate its mass. So what we get is a range of 70 kg as the lowest estimate and higher probably more realistic estimates around 200 to 250 kg. But even if Quetzalcoatlus weighed 250 kg, that would still not be near the 830 kg of a giraffe. Why is that? thanks to its hollow bones, much like in birds today. So could it also fly just like birds? Well, maybe not just like birds. There has been a long debate whether Quetzalcoatlus nothropi was able to fly, but currently it is assumed it could. To fly, Quetzalcoatlus probably used its legs and fingers to push itself off the ground in a similar fashion to bats. And once in the air, the wings took care of the rest. There is another similarity between bats and pterosaurs. Their legs look unfinished. Like they skipped leg day for a serious number of times. In fact, you wonder if they even ever heard of leg day. But there is actually a reason for that. If the bat launching theory is correct, pterosaurs didn't really need their legs for launching. Birds on the other hand jump up in the air for takeoff, which is why they need much more muscles in their legs. Not needing as much muscle mass in their legs was important for pterosaurs to be able to take flight, because more muscle mass would also have come with more weight. And considering the size of the largest pterosaurs, that would have most likely glued them to the ground. So we can probably assume that the bat launching theory is correct. Quetzalcoatlus is of course not the only giant among the pterosaurs. There is also Hasagapteryx, which could reach a similar size, and the more recently discovered Cryodrakin that might be even bigger. So maybe there are some pterosaurs out there still waiting to be discovered that would prove me wrong. But for now, it will most likely have the size of a modern day giraffe a wingspan of about 11 to 12 meters and weigh up to 250 kg and be sporting an oddly small pair of hind legs. But wait, what about the dragon's front legs? Well, that is a question for another time. I hope you enjoyed this kind of content. If you did, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and tell me what you think of these conclusions on dragon size in the comments below. Thanks for watching and stay curious. Anyway, farewell.